The news of Germany's surrender reaches the people of... In the final days of the war in Europe, the American warship Eagle 56 explodes off the New England coast. The whole thing was like a nightmare. The ship vanishes. with only a few survivors. Not a good boys aboard that ship. Leaving only mystery in its wake. Why did this happen? Why couldn't we have saved more people? The Navy concludes it was a mechanical failure. The hard thing is mothers and fathers thinking who aboard that ship was so negligent that they killed my son. Huh? While others point to a startling killer, a Nazi U-boat hunting within sight of American shores. They distorted the facts. It was a preordained decision. I said, wow, we have a cover-up here. Now, a new investigation is being mounted to find the lost wreckage of the Eagle 56 and solve this mystery. Ryan, trail is pinned and the lights are off. All right, perfect. Okay. All right, so we're going to stash those up here next to my breather. Ryan King, Jeff Goudreau, Danny Allen, and Bob Foster are shipwreck hunters. Known as the Nomad Exploration Team, they've managed to discover nearly a dozen wrecks over the years. All right, let's go play. But for the past four years, they've been attempting to find the unfindable, a shipwreck known as Eagle 56. Eagle 56 is the holy grail of New England shipwrecks. So many people know about it, but no one's ever found it. And it's been this mystery, one of the last, if not perhaps the last US Navy ship that went down in the Atlantic Ocean in World War II. It's like a murder mystery without a body. Southern Germany, allied troops move forward to complete the occupation of the... The puzzle dates back to 1945 and the final weeks before Germany's surrender. Off the coast of Maine, far from enemy lines, the Eagle, a Navy warship, was running training exercises. And then... an explosion rips through the ship. Within minutes, the Eagle is gone, taking almost all her crew, never to be seen again. It's only five or six miles out of the harbor, and it was witnessed by people on shore, other ships nearby. 500 witnesses you know, heard the explosion, saw the explosion, multiple ships saw the explosion. It's got to be there. And everybody knew it had to be there. So the fact that no one has found this, it's absolutely unbelievable. When we first got into this, we figured, well, it can't be that hard. We should know where this thing is. But also, we want to solve a mystery. The question has always been, what caused the sinking of the Eagle 56? This is the heart of the Eagle mystery. There are two theories. The first and official conclusion came from the Navy, who determined it was a mechanical failure, an overpressurized boiler in the engine room. But there's another version to the story. Of 62 crew, only 13 survived. 
but some of them claimed they saw a Nazi U-boat. It's not impossible. Though few remember it, one of the critical battles of World War II was fought right here on America's doorstep against a deadly enemy, German submarines. The Germans were able to hunt Allied shipping with impunity and really without much fear of countermeasures or defensive measures. Hundreds of Allied ships were sunk and thousands of Allied sailors killed. Was the Eagle one of the battle's final casualties? Both theories are equally credible. And yet before either could be investigated, the story vanished from the headlines. News of Germany's surrender reaches the people of... Drowned out by news of Hitler's suicide and the Nazis' surrender. The fate of the Eagle 56 faded into obscurity, leaving only questions in its wake. If it was indeed one of the last combat casualties of the Atlantic War, then why was the Navy so insistent that it was a boiler explosion? Our thought was always, if we could actually see the ship, maybe that would give some insight as to what the cause was. But for four years now, the team has yet to find a single trace of the Eagle. Very frustrating, the days you spend out in the ocean and you know, just no results at the end of the day. There are times when we'll just get out and it's obvious it was just a big rock on the bottom. We thought it was a ship, it wasn't. So you explore the rock. We're not professional divers. So it's not like we can budget the entire month of June to go look for this wreck. We have to work around everybody else's schedule. So I work for the school system as a technology coordinator and my wife and I run a horse farm. Jeff drives a meat truck. Danny works in IT. And Bob's an environmental consultant. And it doesn't leave a whole lot of time for wreck dive. We don't have sponsors, you know? <laughs> we go out on the weekend and you burn two or $300 worth of gas, and that's, that's like you're eating ramen noodles for the rest of the week. We'll go ahead and take this thing up tight, see what the current's doing, and then get a good mark on the GPS, and then we'll be able to line that up. We'll send the bag up. I have seen a lot of shipwrecks. I like the mystery behind them. I like the story behind them. When you come down that line and it's pitch black and you're sinking and sinking, and uh, when that shipwreck comes into view for the first time and you are the first person to see it, is is unmatched. They, they got goosebumps. But so far, this wreck has eluded them. The team has investigated dozens of possible targets without success. Out of options, they began reaching out to previous search teams, like sonar expert Gary Kozak. Years ago, Kozak was part of a team, one of many, that tried and failed to find the eagle. I missed it, absolutely missed it. And the problem was is that the area is at least 80% or more rock outcropping. It's absolutely the worst kind of area you would search for anything in. No one was more disappointed than the man who helped organize the search and spent years looking. My name is Paul Lawton. My background is I'm an attorney. Um, I have a history background. As a young kid, we had a house down at Cape Cod, and I became very interested in scuba diving. I became fascinated with the history of the shipwrecks off the American Northeast Coast and became somewhat of an expert. But the Eagle 56 was more than a curiosity for Lawton. It was personal. What do you have? Oh, a bunch of stuff. Mm. Where'd you get that picture from? Paul Westerland was two years old when his father left the house for the last time to report for duty aboard the Eagle 56. He timed it so that he stayed at home as long as he could. He had just made it within a matter of minutes to his ship. And um, if he had gone AWOL, uh, I don't know where he would have been. 
in the jailhouse somewhere for a while. I don't know what, what they would have done back then, but all I know is you would have still been alive and, and been with us. Well, I remember my brothers and my sister were there, and, and um, it was a sad moment for everybody, obviously. Yeah. But um, it uh, was just a matter of time that uh, he would have been with us or not. Westerland barely recalls that day, but he remembers exactly what came next. An odd summary from the Navy. The ship was powered by oil-fired boilers, which turned a steam turbine. The Navy later reported to the family that it was these boilers that had exploded, sinking the Eagle 56. That's what we believe. And my brother and sister always said, Mom said that she doesn't believe it. She, she knows something else must have happened. Yeah. And I, I don't know what it was that made her think that way. But for over 50 years, Paul Westerlin could find little else to explain his father's death until he began talking with a family friend. I've known the Westerlin brothers my entire life. They're family friends. I kind of consider them to be cousins. There's a copy of the Western Union that they brought to the home. The disappearance of your husband, like he disappeared. I had no idea. You didn't know that? I had no idea that your father had been killed. I've known you guys since I was a little kid. I said, wait a minute, I, as a kid, I met your father. They said, no, that was our stepfather. Our real father died in 1945, April of 45. I said, I've never heard of this. What's the name of the boat? They said, it was called the Eagle. I said, the Eagle? I said, I've, no, I've researched every single boat, every warship, and what you're telling me doesn't make any sense. You do not hear of ships in World War II exploding like this. The story of a boiler explosion was absolutely unbelievable. And that's one of the reasons that I said, we have to look further into this. It became an absolute obsession. Basically, I spent most of my time not practicing law, but chasing archival records and corresponding with German researchers and historians. And uh, they were going to kick me out of the law firm at that time. <laughs> we did our search in uh -huh. 2000 with Gary Cozy. For years, Lawton exhausted every resource he had without success. He had given up on ever finding the wreck. And then he was contacted by Ryan King and the Nomad Exploration Team. Well, we know the ship broke in half roughly a mid The dive team could explore places Lawton and the previous team never could, but they needed new leads. I started bugging him. Hey, what do you think of this target? Hey, what do you think of this target? And he finally said, this is what I've got for the area. And there was one obvious target that definitely looked man-made. The problem was we're looking for a 200-foot warship, and the thing was about 20 feet long. It looked like a little rowboat on the bottom, right? And it's like, no way this can be a warship. Though the anomaly seems too small to be the Eagle, the team will check it out for the sake of due diligence. We'll go ahead and take this thing up tight, see what the current's doing, and then get a good mark on the GPS. All right, well, let's take a look. You can see the shadow behind it. Really? Yeah. I always hope that today is the day that we're going to find it. But the odds are pretty slim we're actually going to find anything today. Right there. How bad is the current running? Yeah, I'll get it for you. Get clear. Right, Go. Yeah, all right. Here when you're ready. Get clear. And then I hear Jeff, he starts hooting around and waving his light at me. I'm yelling to Bob, Bob, you gotta get over here, get over here, look at this, you know. All of a sudden they went, holy crap. The Nomad Exploration Team has sent two divers down to check the sonar anomaly identified by the previous expedition though it appears too small to be the Eagle 56. As you begin to descend, you hold on to a line which is connected to the bottom, and that's what you're gonna follow to the bottom of the ocean. And there's a few interesting things that you feel 
One is the compression of the ocean around you. You're getting deeper, and so it's getting tighter, and it's squeezing you. The other thing that you notice is it gets darker and darker and darker. As you descend past about 150 feet, it gets almost completely black. On a good day, we can see 30 feet, but only if you've got the lights to be able to light it up. You only have 15 to 20 minutes at these depths. So if you pick the wrong direction, you could totally miss the wreck and check it off the list and say that wasn't it. Danny and I were sitting on the surface and we were waiting for an indication that they had actually found a wreck. So we're down 16 minutes. It's within the next 10 minutes we should see something. When we were waiting for a small bottle to come to the surface. The underwater team will send an air bottle to the surface as a signal if they find something. It's always the tough part being up here. And we waited five minutes, no bottle. Waited 10 minutes, no bottle. Waited 20 minutes, no bottle. So we thought, OK, this isn't the wreck. We came down, and there's the muddy bottom and the weight at the end of the line. We could see a drag mark in the mud going out where the current had pulled the weight. The team has dropped a weighted line on their sonar target, but strong currents have dragged it off course. The divers can either return to the surface or see if they can find where the weight originally landed. The odds are it was going to be nothing. It was going to be a rock pile. We figured, well, we're down here. You know, let's, let's go for it. Going along, going along, going along, and all of a sudden, I see this post sticking up out of the bottom. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Is that? You know, I mean, it was a long ways out, right, right at the edge of my light. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't look right, you know? And, we probably went out another 50 feet. And then I hear Jeff, he starts hooting around and, and uh, you know, waving his light at me. I'm yelling to Bob, Bob, you gotta get over here, get over here, look at this, you know. All of a sudden they went, holy crap. <laughs> I can't believe what I'm looking at. Metal wreckage and a pair of boots they appear to be U.S. Navy issue. But is it the Eagle 56? The emotion was huge. I fully expected to find a chunk of a dock or a, a small little fishing boat or anything. It's really phenomenal to finally see something like that. But um, that day, we didn't have a lot of time to spend. Um, we had spent enough time, you know, searching. For now, they must head back to the surface. But this first clue is a promising one. Bob and I are sitting on the line, and we're looking at each other. I could see the total disbelief in his face, and he could see it in my face. Side. Got it. Got it? Yeah. How'd we do? I, I surfaced first and I was so excited. So that was a heck of a dive, huh? That was a good dive, yeah. It was awesome. I mean, there's definitely something big down there. This bill is pretty good. You can see the drag marks in the sand, so okay. in the gravel. So um, we just followed those back and then all of a sudden, bang, there's a wreck. Big wall of steel. Big wall of steel. We left uh, Bob's reel, and Ryan and Danny could just immediately go right to the wreck. Go! Any thought of moving on to other targets has vanished. It's almost like being a kid on Christmas morning. You come downstairs, and there's stuff under the tree, and you have no idea what's in those presents, and all you want to do is get in there and unwrap it. As we got closer, we could start to see a little bit of debris, and then looked up and saw this just wall of steel.
It was just, wow. It's hard to put into words how exhilarating this is. You've been looking for it for four or five years. We start swimming up. And so as we come up and go over top, we see the 16-foot gun. You don't get fishing boats with a 16-foot gun mounted on it. As I was swimming along, you kind of swam down the gun, and I had a chance to really look at where the gunner station would be. There were foot pedals there, and I remember thinking, wow, the last people that sat here were the men that actually went down on the ship. And all of a sudden, it went from exhilaration to people died on this wreck. There's a weird feeling, almost like there's somebody else there. But unfortunately, they are unable to spend more than a few minutes on the wreck. I backed up into a pretty sharp piece of metal, and that sharp piece of metal cut my dry suit, and I'd started leaking. Now, I had 70 minutes of decompression that still needed to be completed, and I'm flooding with 42-degree water. Going back to the surface was probably the farthest thing from our mind, but we need to get going, and we'll come back another day. Oh, what the great stuff. It's interesting. There's, there's a lot there. there. I mean, if, if we could ever get a day... After four years of searching, the team is excited about the discovery. Really impressive. But also cautious. It appears they have found a previously unknown wreck. But their brief search didn't reveal definitive evidence proving it is the Eagle 56. Even the massive deck-mounted gun is not solid proof as many World War II cargo ships carried them for defense. It is possible this could simply be a forgotten merchant ship. We end up with a lot of shipwrecks up here. In fact, there are enough wrecks to go end to end all the way around the Cape. When you start reading about it and diving a lot of these ships, you realize just how many went down out here. The team will need more evidence to confirm the identity of this mystery wreck. But if this is the Eagle 56, they should be able to identify a few unique characteristics common to all the warships of her class. Designed at the height of the First World War, the Eagle ships were aimed at a singular threat, the German Kaiser's U-boats. As America joins the war, the US Navy needs a defense Subchaser warships. They turn to automobile magnate Henry Ford, and the Eagle class warship is born. Ford's vision was a mass produced fleet of anti submarine patrol boats. Their unique blocky design was well suited to Ford's assembly line processes. And then abruptly, World War I came to an end. The Eagle boats were no longer needed. The government cut their order from 100 ships down to just 60. Two decades later, the final year of World War II, only eight of the original 60 Eagle boats were still in service. The aging warships were given minor duties, which is why the Eagle 56 found itself towing a target buoy in the Gulf of Maine instead of on the front lines. It should have been a routine assignment, boring even making it all the more strange that she ended up ripped in half with most of her crew dead. What happened to this ship? For now, the dive team has no answers. But as the crew arrives back at shore, they also know their discovery has introduced a new problem, the US Navy. If this is indeed the Eagle 56, it is a war grave, 
meaning they must notify the Navy. Who's got that uh, bow line? At the same time, they have almost no evidence to prove their case. All right, Bob, you can just take that right there. Not only to the Navy, but to the families of the fallen sailors. We wanted to identify it, you know, to the point where we felt we could conclusively say to them that this is the eagle. But at the same time, we don't want to be seen as those guys that are hiding something from somebody. We just want to be sure that we're giving people accurate information. These families have waited almost 75 years to find the final resting place of their loved ones. And we want to make sure we have the whole story. That's why we're going to keep looking. For now, the team decides to hold off. But they know they can't do so for long. They cannot keep the Navy in the dark, much less the families. Now, this is your letter to them. The Westerland brothers lost their father when the Eagle 56 went down. Well, I'm, I don't think about it all the time, but occasionally, if I'm talking to somebody and uh, about the whole story, you know, and how things went, that that um, he possibly could have, you know, missed his ship. How old was he when he was lost? When he went in 32. Wow. So he was considered an old timer at that time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was working on the shipyards, and all the younger guys were joining up. And so he, he said, enlisted. I, I gotta go. Unbelievable. Yeah. What do you guys remember about your father? I mean, you were young at the time. You were about six I was years old? seven years old. I can uh, recall when the uh, chaplain and Navy officer came to the house and told my mother. I was in the living room, and I recall her and my older sister crying in the kitchen. I vaguely remember sitting in the sofa or something and her trying to explain the whole thing. Mom always told me that he stayed till the last minute. He just wanted to be with her as long as he could before he left. Never came home. To find the boat would, would definitely mean closure. That would be the ultimate thing, to find the boat. But proving that the wreck the dive team has uncovered is the Eagle 56 is not an easy task. There is never any way to be 100% sure that you found the wreck without finding something that directly ties it to the wreck. You're never going to find the printed name of the ship on it anymore. The paint is long gone. However, there are other clues that could make a positive ID possible. Serial numbers are the proof positive. A lot of the equipment that was on a Navy ship was recorded. And it could have been anything from the serial numbers of the compass and the mount that the compass was in. It could have been on clocks. We need to definitively find a serial number that says this is Eagle 56. And if not, then we need to have all markings possible that indicate that it's an Eagle class boat. And so there's still a lot of research to be done. If they can find a serial number somewhere... in the wreckage. It will be the evidence they need to confirm this wreck is indeed the Eagle 56. But they must work fast. The water here will not be warm forever. We have such a small window. Basically, you've got 4th of July, which is like, you know, freezing and shivering, to about October. And then it's cold again, and that's it. We only really get 10 times, maybe over the summer, where we have good days of diving. The clock is running. The season's running out.
Go for it. Electronics, primary display. Yep. Secondary display. In a second. That's what I love about that checklist. All right, go ahead. We follow a checklist on the boat. There has been situations where we've actually missed things, and it's because you're doing so many things on the boat. There's a lot of activity. It's rush, rush, rush. And you don't actually realize until you get in the water whether you've actually done everything that you need to do. You good to go? I'm good to go. All right, let's get you in the water. Diving is dangerous. Anytime you put your head underwater, you can't breathe underwater. So you obviously run the risk of problems. I've lost several, several good friends. Um, a couple of my mentors. It's a calculated risk. I don't want to die. What do I have to do to be safe when I go down that deep? And it's really all about planning and practice and teaming up with the right people to make it happen safely. The Nomad Exploration Team must work quickly to determine whether this wreckage is indeed the Eagle 56, so they can report it to the Navy and the families of the sailors who died. Unfortunately, at these depths, examining the wreck is a slow process like navigating an unfamiliar room in the dark. It's pitch black. It's dark as night, and it's, the water is just full of stuff. As they move down the length of the wreck, they search for serial numbers on each artifact they encounter. The ship's wheel. An anchor. vent pipes, but they find no identifying marks. We haven't found any serial numbers. We'd have to bring up some of that equipment in order to look at it, and that's really doing some major disturbance of the wreck. We don't want to yank things around or move things on the bottom. Even stranger, as they continue their search, it becomes obvious to the divers that large sections of this ship are missing, making its identification even more difficult. It's a jumble. I mean, it's a twist of, of wreckage. There's stuff on top of stuff, and you can see the helm. You can see kind of the general area, but it's all collapsed and blown apart. So it, it could be anywhere. The visibility was not nearly as good as what we hoped for. Thank you. I don't think we found it this definitive, but we definitely got some good footage of it, I think. Then we definitely saw two plates, but um, I didn't see any inscription or anything on that would indicate definitively this is the Eagle 56. But the dive isn't a total loss. They've confirmed an important detail. Most of this ship is missing. The top row of portholes was one, two, three, and then it's a foot behind the third porthole. It's broken off, sheared right off clean, where, the, where it's collapsed behind it. So we only got, at the very best, you've only got half of it, right? I mean, we know we've got at least the bow, but if we're gonna put this together for the Navy, we're gonna find the stern and really close this story out. We only have half the wreck. And that half the wreck doesn't include the boilers, the engine room, or any of those materials that might help us to more conclusively prove that we have found Eagle 56. It's a significant setback. Without the entire ship, it brings into question whether the divers can even make a positive ID, much less answer the question of how the Eagle was sunk. Not every day is successful. But as long as the same number of divers come back up that went down, it's not all bad. Port side, I feel bad. I guess we'll just get it next time. Uh, 
The Nomad Exploration Team has come up empty for now. But there is more than one way to investigate the fate of the Eagle 56. Boston attorney Paul Lawton has spent years searching World War II historical records. But this case was unlike any he'd ever seen. As soon as I saw the Navy's determination that the Eagle 56 exploded, lifted out of the water, broke in two so violently and sank with such a great loss of life, that doesn't happen by a boiler explosion. There's something here that is not making any sense. We have to look further into this. I'd been working with the Navy for years. So I requested all of the documents pertaining to the loss of the USS Eagle PE-56. What should have been a simple documents request soon became much more complicated. The US Navy claimed to have lost their files from the long-term storage facility, which didn't make any sense, because I know that they keep duplicate records in different storage facilities. And that's when I thought something was amiss. And I said, wow, we have a cover-up here. Paul Lawton's inquiries with the Navy seem to have hit a wall. All records related to the Eagle 56 have been lost, leaving him to piece together the story from other sources. Having studied World War II for decades, Lawton begins with the history the Battle of the Atlantic, and an advanced German technology, deadly submarines known as U-boats. Their U-boat technology at that time had advanced so much that they had a real lead in uh, surprise against the Allies. Early on, just as in World War I, the U-boats seemed to be virtually unstoppable. Their initial battle to try and cut off maritime communications and the supply routes to England brought uh, England to its knees. Following Pearl Harbor and America's entry into the war, the U-boats then add a new target, American ships. The Germans decided that they needed to stem the influx of war materials to England and brought the Battle of the Atlantic to the American Northeast Coast. The code name for the U-boat assault is Paukenschlag, Operation Drumbeat. Five weeks after Pearl Harbor, on January 14, 1942, Hitler's U-boats descend on the U.S. East Coast. It was a, basically a turkey shoot. They were engaging mostly unarmed merchant ships they couldn't defend themselves. They find the U.S. East Coast virtually undefended. After the losses at Pearl Harbor, the Navy has reassigned many of its warships to the Pacific. Beyond that, their top priority is to guard the troop transports now ferrying American GIs to England, leaving only a handful of ships and Coast Guard planes to defend the East Coast including an aging sub-hunter left over from World War I, the Eagle 56. As part of this threadbare defense, the Eagle sees action in rescue operations after the Navy destroyer Jacob Jones is sunk by U-boats in 1942. The U-boat attacks are relentless, operating in deadly wolf packs. They openly hunt within sight of U.S. shores, even penetrating the waters around New York City. In just a few short years, the Germans sink hundreds of ships, killing thousands of Allied sailors. And in many cases...
cases, they would actually engage the convoys in which they would get inside the convoys and start attacking them from inside and out. And uh, it really caused massive losses to the Allies in ships and personnel. Was the sinking of the Eagle 56 just the latest loss in this battle for the Atlantic? It seems possible, except for one thing. By 1945, when the Eagle is sunk, the Allies have gained an incredible weapon. They are intercepting U-boat transmissions, literally reading the Germans' mail, which means they know exactly where each U-boat is. And yet, the local Navy bases don't record any U-boats operating in the area. If the Navy knows about the U-boats, then why are they so sure there wasn't a U-boat in the area when the Eagle exploded? Is it possible a single U-boat slipped through undetected? Or was the Navy telling the truth? Was this really a boiler explosion? For this team, the only way to get answers is to get back out on the wreck and keep looking. We're going to take one last look at the bow to see if we can find an identifiable mark that will help put this mystery to bed. With their season running out, the team has called in a favor. They've recruited underwater photographer Evan Kovacs to aid their search. We don't really need all the donuts, as good as they are. It's great to have Evan here today because he has a lot more experience with documenting these wrecks. His camera does better in low light. He's got bigger lights. And the reality is, filming in New England, you just need light. High quality video documentation of the wreck is a critical piece of the investigation. If this is indeed the Eagle 56, they'll have to report it to the Navy, which means they need as much professional quality evidence as they can get. We don't want the Navy coming to us. We're not doing anything wrong. We don't want the Navy thinking that we're vandals or we're disrespecting it. So we want to find both pieces, identify it, you know, to the point where we felt we could, we could conclusively say to them that this is the eagle. Um, as you come up the main structure here, uh, you'll sitting see the... Assuming, of course, that this is the Eagle 56. When we go to the Navy, we want it to be crystal Concrete. clear that this is the Eagle 56. Okay, so that's the lower shot, which is, you know, very distinctive to the eagle. And then there's the gun up on top, but is there anything that you found that's like, no, definitely eagle yet? Nothing At this yet. point, no. I mean, when we did drop down the first time, I mean, this 16-foot gun makes a Yeah, it's kind of a distinctive case. argument. Yeah. yeah. So we looked through some historical pictures of, okay. there were some serial numbers, and there were some tags up on top, too. So thinking maybe the serial number on the, the breach might be there. So what, what's the depth range? That we'll... 245, probably right? With the right. tide we got today, it might be 240. Okay. All right, we're ready to go diving? All right, we're ready to go. All right, let's uh, fire this motor up. Some people, sometimes they take some years to identify wrecks. We uh, sure as heck don't want to spend another winter going, where's the rest of it, you know? So the clock is running in the sense of we've only got until, you know, October, November. The season's running out. But the underwater investigation is only half the story. Hi, I'd like to speak with the Deputy Assistant Judge Advocate General, please. Back on land, Attorney Paul Lawton has dealt with his share of frustrating searches as well, particularly when searching for the Navy's records on the Eagle 56. The way things work in the Navy is whenever there's a loss of a warship, they call witnesses, the witnesses are sworn, they're asked questions as a court stenographer, and there's a written record for every single warship, every aircraft sunk. So I requested those documents from the US Naval Historical Center. I requested them from the National Archives. I kept receiving denials claiming that all of the documents pertaining to the loss of the USS Eagle were lost from their long-term storage facilities. A request I made for a court of inquiry into the sinking of the US Navy. So ultimately, I ended up to the Judge Advocate General of the US Navy, and they also claimed that their records did not exist. That was the end of it. The Navy was unwilling to assist the investigation, but Lawton, an attorney by training would not be deterred. 
Instead, he began building his case the only way he knew how, collecting everything he could find. We went to the manufacturer of the ship, the ship that allegedly exploded as a result of a catastrophic failure. And uh, some of the records we received were things like blueprints from the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan. Unfortunately, he was missing a critical ingredient, eyewitnesses. Then his friend Paul Westerland proposed a wild idea, place a newspaper ad in the Boston Globe. I decided to put a thing in the classified ads saying that if anyone has any information or knows anything about the PE-56, which was sunk off the coast of Maine, um, I'd like to get in touch with anyone that knows anything about it. It was a long shot. But with the Navy refusing to grant access to its files, eyewitnesses were now Lawton's only chance at figuring out the missing pieces of the story. We have to find if there were survivors, other witnesses, and that's where we went with it. The only question was whether there were eyewitnesses still alive to tell their story. Uh, with the season yeah, running out, the Nomad the Exploration West. Team is worried there has been no definitive evidence so far to identify this wreck as the Eagle 56. Yep. Primary mission today, come back safe, obviously, yep. but is to definitively say this is yep. the bow, is that? Yeah, get video footage, say this is the Eagle, yep. and then uh, we're also... Alongside underwater cameraman Evan Kovacs, they must find serial numbers or similar evidence, and they must find it fast. All right, so we'll go diving. Short lived. The Eagle's gotten personal. You learn about the crew, and you learn their stories and their families, and you meet their families, and you learn their background. Okay. Unfortunately, this story's been forgotten. And it's hard to say that with 49 Americans dead. Unfortunately, I think these guys just kind of fell into history. And um, that was that. The team is determined to keep the Eagle's crew from being forgotten. But to do that, they still need to prove that this is indeed their ship. With high definition cameras running, the dive team surveys the bow once more in search of evidence. They come across three pipes, which appear to match the distinctive triple vent pipes mounted on all the Eagle ships. They also find the windlass, used to pull the anchor up, which appears to match the factory-installed units on other Eagle ships. And then, the crucial piece. A handle, likely from a steam pipe, bearing three letters. USN, United States Navy. This was a warship. And that's when we knew that this is the Eagle 56. Good dive. We uh, accomplished what we were trying to do. This is the Eagle 56. Though they found no serial numbers, to them, the evidence is overwhelming. They believe this is a US Navy Eagle boat. You got the bow, you got the guns, everything's where it's supposed to be. The portholes are in place, everything is good. 
Uh, we found a bunch of little identifying features. I don't know what's left. I mean, this has got to be the eagle. It's a major step forward. You've been working on this project for four or five years. There was a definitely a lot of validation for us. But it also raises more questions than answers. Where is the other half of the ship? We weren't even back to the dock, and the discussion already happened of, where's the stern? And more importantly, how did the Eagle 56 sink? Was it really the boiler that exploded? Or is there more to the story? Until they can answer these questions, the team is not ready to go to the Navy. But there is one person they do want to notify. And Danny says, we should call Paul and, and tell him. It was thanks to Paul Lawton and Gary Kozak that the team first discovered the wreckage. Paul, he says, uh, we've got some news for you. And he's like, OK. I said, I, I think we just found Eagle 56. You could hear a pin drop. <laughs> it was awesome. Unbelievable. But Lawton is equally confused about the missing half of the wreck. We know it has to be out there. It's just a matter of where it is. But there may be something that can help. Years earlier, Lawton and his friend Paul Westerland put an ad in the newspaper searching for survivors. Amazingly, they got a response. Ready to roll? Three survivors answered the ad. Lawton brought the men in to give formal witness statements. We had a court stenographer come in, and we took their statements under oath. And they were able to give us their opinions and things that I didn't even think of. I'm on station. A local filmmaker documented the interviews. All three men passed away shortly after. These tapes are now the last memories of the sinking of the Eagle 56. And the whole thing was like a nightmare. I, you know, like but it may be exactly what the team needs to find the missing pieces of the story. When the ship broke in half, the bow section floated forward. The rear section floated back. So there was a distance between those parts of the ship. Hit it for one second. Go back a little bit. I want to hear that again. OK. And the story they tell is nothing like the official version.